Hola a todos, buenas tardes. Uh, welcome everybody to our event today. I'm Cristel Jusino Diaz, Centro's uh, Director of Research Programs and Public Humanities. I'm also the coordinator of our Mellon Supported Bridging the Divides Initiative, which is currently uh, convening our initial interdisciplinary study group focused on the theme of decolonization. Um, and today, as part of this initiative, we're hosting a cafecito con Dr. Jose Caraballo Cueto, who's going to be discussing his latest research, which evaluates some of the macroeconomic prospects that Puerto Rico could expect after a change in its political status. Um, before I um, let our, ghost, our, our, our guest um, uh, present the research, I want to um, tell you a little bit more about them. So Dr. Jose Caraballo Cueto currently works as an associate professor graduate business school in the University of Puerto Rico at Rio Piedras. He worked for eight years in the University of Puerto Rico at Calle, where he was also a regular researcher in the Institute for Interdisciplinary Research and the director of the Census Information Center of Puerto Rico. Caraballo completed a PhD in economics at the New School for Social Research in 2013, where he specialized in econometrics, a branch of statistics and development. He's being joined today by Massimiliano Lamarca, who completed a PhD in economics at the New School of, for Social Research in 2007. And he works as a senior economist at the International Labor Organization. Um, so I'm going to um, let our guests take the presentation onwards. If you have any questions in the meantime, there will be time for our panelists to answer them. Please use the Q&A box so that we can keep track of all of these uh, questions. So Jose, I will give it to you. Hi, hello everybody. I just I just need some permission to share my presentation. Uh, maybe to share the host. Um, you should be able to share now. Let me see. Yes. All right. So um, the view expressed here in this presentation doesn't represent the uh, the official. Uh, opinions of the International Labor Organization or the University of Puerto Rico. Um, so here, what we're trying to answer is the question of what will Puerto Rico economic future look like if there is a change in the political status, either towards statehood or towards sovereignty. This analysis is limited to the possible effects that a change in the status uh, could have on the Puerto Rican economy. We are not looking for a cultural or a social analysis. That is not my uh, or our um, expertise. We are not ser searching or promoting the most democratic or dignifying or feasible or political politically correct option. And of course, this is not a, a proselytist um, activity. Um, this, this project was funded by the Open Society Foundation and I don't belong and Massimiliano doesn't belong to any political party. Um, so I'm going to present some literature review very quickly because I don't have a lot of time. Then we go to uh, show some econometric analysis uh, and also um, some modeling of what will happen to the economy of Puerto Rico if, if it moves towards stable or towards sovereignty. So Puerto Rico uh, has been in possession of the United States in 1898, as many of you know, in 1952, it, it was granted as a, a form of self-government. Uh, at that moment, or, or close to that moment, a project in Puerto Rico was established, an economic development project that was called Operation Bootstrap. And from 1955 to 1980, the Puerto Rican economy was among the top 14 growing economies in the world. And that led the Puerto Rican economy to modernize. And the economic model at that time was rather simple. It was just attracting manufacturing companies from the United States, especially uh, to Puerto Rico. But uh, once the United States removed tax incentives to the, uh, those US companies located in Puerto Rico, the economy of Puerto Rico collapsed. So I'm going to start um, without any particular preference with the, what will happen to the economy if we move to statehood. So right now the economy has been since 2006 in an economic depression. 
And it has grown for a couple of years, especially when there is a, a large influx of federal funds, such as in 2012, and right now in the middle of the reconstruction after Maria. But uh, we fear, many people fear that after those funds are ended, the economy is going to collapse once again because there is no um, new economic model behind. So some people have proposed, let's move to the statehood. Other people have said, well, let's move to, to sovereignty. So what will what, what, could, can, what could we expect out of these movements? Well, in the case of the statehood, um, you have heard a lot that Puerto Rico will be entitled to additional federal uh, funding, especially we, we will have parity in the case of the SSI, which is the supplemental security income. In, uh, we will have parity with the states with respect to the nutritional assistance program, parity with respect to Medicare, which is the uh, a uh, healthcare plan for the elderly and already with respect to Medicaid, which is the uh, healthcare plan for the low income population. Uh, but we, we also need to be aware that federal taxes will be applied for income generated in the island. Uh, and that representation in Congress um, can help voting representation, Puerto Rico right now doesn't have voting representation in Congress, just have some, uh, uh, what we call a resident commissioner that it just have voice but not vote power. Uh, in that case, there is a voting representation, maybe Puerto Rico can uh, look for particular policies that can help the, the, the economic island. So if you have some advantages and you have also some disadvantages and, and, and we have to be aware, aware of it that, uh, that you know, we have some trade-off in, in any movement that we, that we uh, pursue. We look at the data of Hawaii, for instance, and the population in Hawaii grew after statehood. Uh, the income per capita of Hawaii or the average income um, was uh, for most of the post statehood period uh, was above the average income in the rest of the states. Uh, so, uh, we we can't say that Hawaii uh, per capita income was uh, harmed or impact by statehood. Of course, there have been a, a lot of discussion about gentrification in Hawaii uh, and, and how the uh, prices, the price level uh, increase a lot uh, and so on and so forth. But in the case of average income, we can say that the average income declined. Um, in the case of Alaska, Alaska have a, a higher uh, average income than the United States as, as a whole uh, before statehood. And after statehood, it has remained a, a, a above the, the average income in the United States. But uh, we can say that relative to that income of the United States, it has declined. In the case of New Mexico, which for some reason, Many of the people that believe in statehood, they don't quote a lot New Mexico. I believe New Mexico will be a better example for Puerto Rico than Alaska because most of the population in Mexico at the moment of, uh, or a large part of it at the moment of the statehood uh, were Hispanic uh, and they didn't speak English as well. Um, and the level of income of New Mexico before statehood and for a large part, I mean, for the whole part, and uh, even right now is still below the average of the United States. Uh, it, it did converge for, for, from the 1930 to the 1960, but after the 1960, the average income of New Mexico have been almost uh, stable relative to the United States. In the case of sovereignty, uh, I know that there is a lot of differences, the legal differences between independence and free association. Um, we don't, in, in the case of economics, which is our, our expertise, um, we don't see a lot of differences except for that uh, access to the US citizenship will keep uh, a, a labor market in Puerto Rico that is open with the United States uh, as of now. So if anybody right now wants to move to the labor market in the United States, you have to take a, a ticket uh, for $300 or less and, and they are now in the US market. Uh, so that will occur under under the free association, under independence, you don't have that. The labor market of Puerto Rico will be closed relative to the United States. Uh, 
Some people have said that, well, if Puerto Rico would have been independent or sovereignty, it could have their own tax incentives to uh, particular uh, industries and business segments. Uh, it could have trade treaties with um, other countries that the U.S. is not having a, a, a treaty right now. Um, it will get rid of the Jones Act and it could have more integration to the Latin American region and not just to the United States. It could uh, have more exports, it could substitute more imports, uh, and it could promote the expansion of, of tourism. Because right now, if you're a tourist from China or from many countries, and uh, if you want to come to Puerto Rico as a tourist, you need to apply for a visa. Uh, but under sovereignty, Puerto Rico could do as the Dominican Republic. They can just say, well, if you're come here as a tourist, you don't need a visa no longer. Uh, but they're also, as I said, they are always trade -off. The person that tells, tell you that uh, under statehood or, or under sovereignty, there will no, be no challenges, it's lying to you. Um, there are gonna be challenges anyway. In the case of the of, of sovereignty, uh, Puerto Rico, many people said that it's gonna have a, a massive loss of population, uh, especially of all the, uh, uh, population in Puerto Rico that is close to a million right now that is dependent on federal transfers, uh, not just the, the PAN, which is the Nutritional Assistance Program, but also Section A and others, they, not all of them, but many of them will migrate to the United States. It's not a, an annual migration as we have seen during the last few years, but a, a, one, a one time uh, migration that the people move to the United States looking for um, that social um, policy. The monetary policy, for instance, if they devaluate the currency, that is going to help exporters and it's going to help the GDP to grow, but it's going to increase the level of prices in the island because uh, when you devaluate a currency, um, imports become uh, uh, more expensive. Uh, and of course, there is this discussion that if Puerto Rico will be able to have better trade deals with foreign countries than what the U.S. is doing right now, uh, that is basically having a lot of bargaining power where it's going to negotiate any international trade deal. Uh, so that is open to discussion. Um, what we know is that if Puerto Rico uh, is sovereignty, it's it going to have the ability to um, bring more migrants from abroad. So right now, uh, the US is controlling borders in Puerto Rico. Um, so yes, Puerto Rico is going to lose, is going to lose population, um, but it can also attract more migrants and try to compensate for that loss. Um, and yeah, Puerto Rico uh, will not be uh, subject to the federal fund, to all the federal funding that is receiving right now, Maybe it's social security and Medicare, which is being paid by residents, uh, it can remain under uh, an amicable uh, independence. But uh, funding related to Section A, to the Pell Grant, and to the Nutritional Assistance Program, it's hard to say that they're going to remain in Puerto Rico. Uh, and also the central bank, you need a central bank in order to have your own currency. Um, it can have problem of credibility uh, because it's a small country. And, uh, you know, it's, it's going to take time to, to build that credibility. Of course, they are successful, as we have say, seen in the case of the states. There are also successful sovereignties around the world and unsuccessful sovereignties. And when I say successful, I mean that countries that after independence, um, they were able to uh, increase a lot their their material well-being. And that's been the case of Singapore, Trinidad and Tobago, Ireland, Czech Republic, and many others. And I picked these four because our small countries uh, and similar to Puerto Rico in that sense. Um, but can we state that independence helped most of the country, not just a few of them, um, it, 
to answer, in order to answer that question, we need a, a systematic analysis. And that's when econometrics help us. I took data from the 10 word tables, which is a panel of data. I have data from the 1970 to 2019, and I'm able to, to put all those countries there are close to 200 countries and evaluate if those that be, be, became independent during the, after the 1960, if they were able to catch up relative to the US or if they were able to converge. Uh, so I was able also to evaluate some current colonies vis-a-vis -vis those independent countries and uh, those countries that obtained their sovereignty or you know, were created before 1960. Uh, so in the case of current colonies, which are these that I have here, Aruba, Bermuda, the British Virgin Island, Cayman Island, Palestine, Macau, New, Pol New Caledonia, St. Kitts and Nevis, and Martin, Puerto Rico is not there because it doesn't have the necessary data. You, you know, the, the, the challenges that we have in Puerto Rico with the data. Uh, so what we see is that in terms of the growth of the GDP per capita, the GDP is a gross domestic product. It's a relatively uh, gross measure of the average income, the GDP per capita. It increased by 3% in that period that I'm analyzing. Uh, and that and that um, growth rate was above of those independent countries or, or, or what I call recent independent countries um, that grew on average uh, at a rate of about 1.5%. But most of those current colonies have a relatively low population, uh, far lower than the population of Puerto Rico. The average was about half, half a million inhabitants. Puerto Rico have almost right now about 3 million uh, of individuals. And, and those countries that became independent, they are relatively large compared to Puerto Rico. Uh, so with this data, I'm not able to answer the question that I just posed. Most of the countries converge or not. This is what I need. I need something more uh, systematic that control for other factors. So what I, what I did is I, I estimate the solo swan um, growth model, which is one of the most influential in economics, and I and I evaluate how a country converged relative to the to the U.S. after controlling for the population growth rate, the human capital, um, the level of investments, the total productivity, and then after I control for those factors, I'm able to isolate. Uh, the effect of independence over convergence. And what I found is that uh, current colonies are not converging uh, relative to the US, uh, at least under the, the period that I'm starting, but that uh, former colonies, those recent colonies that uh, gained uh, independence after the 1960, uh, they did uh, converge or most of them converge. And when I control or when I reduce the sample uh, to those countries that have more data, uh, I also found that those countries that have a, a relatively high initial GDP per capita or the initial conditions under independence were relatively high uh, and not other countries that gain independence on, on their, uh, after a war, after destruction, so those countries that gain independence with a relatively high level of income, which will be the case of Puerto Rico, uh, also converge faster uh, to the uh, growth rate of the United States. This is not to say that that was the, the uh, determinant of, of uh, that had the highest influence. The most influential variables were the level of investment, the level of population growth, and uh, the level of productivity. Uh, so we also have to, in this analysis, consider what I said about the population. Population growth is important for uh, economic growth uh, on average. And if we lost population, we need to see the ways to uh, compensate for that. So I'm going to leave Massey to present the rest of the presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Jose. And uh, I will share my, my screen now. Okay, so you can see from me. Um, 
All right. Okay. So let me uh, introduce also an important part of this uh, research project, which has been uh, production of a data set and uh, of uh, a model, um, a simulation model for Puerto Rico. So um, first, let me uh, say a few words about these kind of models. This is a structuralist uh, computational general equilibrium models for, for uh, scenario analysis. And uh, we need to build first a consistent and comprehensive data set for the Puerto Rican economy. Uh, social accounting metrics is typically used for these kind of models. And uh, I will uh, illustrate some aspects of the social accounting metrics, plus some also satellites to this uh, data set. Um, and also we, we designed the model that captures some structural characteristics of the economy. In that sense, uh, we're trying to capture some relationship, a key relationship between uh, actors, between sectors, uh, and uh, distributional relationship also. Um, analysis and scenario analysis is uh, what we can do after we have all these uh, components. And uh, it's important to highlight the fact that uh, we are going to do an what if uh, exercise, which means um, we have. Uh, um, is, is the fine structure in the economy, a model that can, um, uh, let's say, highlight uh, or uh, bring bring to the um, to the fore some linkages between uh, between um, uh, variables, between sectors, between distributional outcomes. Since we want to see what happen if uh, what ha what would be the consequences, maybe the growth, maybe the structural. Uh, the employment, uh, the, uh, the distributional consequences of some hypotheses. And uh, because uh, the, uh, the issue of uh, statehood or independence uh, it, it comprises a lot of policies and possible shocks in the economy, we need to wrap up these uh, shocks, these uh, policies into scenarios. You can imagine there will be there can be infinite ways to combine uh, situations and policies. So we had to choose some of those and see what could be the outcome under those scenarios. Now let me show you something about uh, the structuralist models. It's similar uh, to some forms of uh, input output of SEM analysis, but also as uh, some elements of uh, CG computational general equilibrium. The important things to point out is an economy wide disaggregated model, but at the same time uh, goes at the uh, sectoral levels. And there is a general equilibrium in the sense that uh, every sector is uh, in some form of equilibrium, not necessarily a market clearing equilibrium. It's based on, on national accounts, and uh, um, it allows for underutilization of resources that is in unemployment. And of course, uh, we, uh, we define different closures in terms of what is the endogenous and, and, and exogenous variable. So it's important to point out that uh, some uh, characteristics in economies like uh, Puerto Rico is that uh, some markets are functioning, for example, with more price clearing and some markets are functioning with more quantity clearing and, uh, and some prices can be fixed by cost while some prices can be more driven by demand. So um, we want to uh, highlight the characteristics of the economy and to see how it works. Um, this is a social accounting metrics. It's an accounting framework that takes the national accounts first and introduce uh, uh, also labor force statistics, also budget uh statistics and uh, put together to make a consistent data set so not only the national accounts which is of course all the measure of production of incomes of corporation government uh, and households and the flow uh, from the generation to the distribution but also how this is impacting for example employment by occupation and also households by uh, quintile. So we want to see also some distributional aspects. So household by quintile is 20% of, uh, of the population divided by increased level of uh, income. 
um, characteristics of the sem is that is uh, is a square as uh, uh, row sums equal to column sums because in a, is an accounting system and is can be used for various ways. So just let me let me give you a sense of, of the data work. This is a a, a very com, um, let's say compressed uh, sem of for Puerto Rico. There was no sem for Puerto Rico. There was an input output table from two thousand and seven. And we created the SAM for the base year 2017 because, as uh, Jose mentioned, uh, the economy has undergone some current uh, changes um, since 2017, which uh, they might not reflect the medium uh, run, let's say, long run characteristics of the economy because uh, there was some exceptional expenditure. So this uh, SAM is uh, picturing the structural characteristics of uh, of the economy and let me just say that here we can have uh, uh, three activities goods service and government activities in the real sam uh, we have 19 activities and then uh, uh, and also uh, goods and services the sam is basically telling us how much of products are purchased by certain activities and this is reminds us of the input output part and also how certain activities are generating income uh, in the forms of wages or profit or taxes and you can see already uh, here for example that production of goods is producing uh, that amount of uh, aggregate wages and so on profits while services are producing more uh wages uh, because they are more labor intensive and the government is also uh have zero profits and so is also uh producing um wages for the employees i just want to highlight some parts here of the current transactions for example where households are purchasing goods and services and government services but also we have uh, that uh, um Corporation, government, and households are uh, transferring uh, incomes to corporation, government, households, uh, for example, in the form of uh, taxation or benefits. Uh, the government is transferring uh, incomes to the households in the form of uh, um, benefits, and also uh, households and government are transferring resources to the government house and corporation to the government in a form of uh, uh, taxation. Now, we the important characteristics of this analysis is to have uh, the, the mainland USA separate from the rest of the world. So we have the rest of the world, we have two entities here, two regions. One is the USA and the rest of the world, which are all the other regions. So. And we can see how much is the exports, how much in goods and services, how much are the transfers. And also, we also split with some satellites, also how much are the uh, tourist um, revenues and revenue coming from tourism from um, uh, US tourists and from the rest of the world. So we could have a, um, a, a picture of uh, how much is the current uh, revenue from tourism and also also as a reminder how much are the benefits coming from uh, the the us or other flows of payments in the form of remittances from the us and or the rest of the world now um, i just want to show you that this uh, this data set can have a number of different um, um, ways to be expanded, to be um, um, composing uh, like the reality in different uh, in different details. For example, here I uh, just split the households into two groups: the bottom eighty percent and the top twenty percent. You can see from here the consumption uh, of the top twenty uh, percent is almost double the one of the bottom. Uh, Eighty percent in terms of goods, uh, similar in terms of services. Um, we can read also the incomes, the net incomes, uh, and see also immediately how much is the 
um, distributional aspects of income. Now, let me show that not only we can picture the current transactions in their totality like here, but we can also have a step-by-step -step, um, um, view of how the income is generated through wages, then distributed to institutions like uh, the corporation, the government, and the households of different quantiles, but then how this uh, income is also um, redistributed with a secondary distribution. And so we can have a more detailed picture of what are the redistributional outcome of policies. And this is particularly important uh, in the analysis of the scenario because many of the uh, elements of the scenario are uh, taxes, federal taxes, or federal benefits, or a change also in um, local taxes and local benefits, which uh, makes uh, the difference between the primary distribution, secondary distribution, particularly relevant. Now I can already present uh, some scenario. Um, well, statehood, we, let's see first scenario of statehood, situation where there is uh, an increase in, in uh, federal benefits, mostly to the poorest. Imagine like a three billions available for the households of the two lowest quantile, most of these uh, um, benefits to the lowest quantile and partly to the second lower. Federal tax rate on richer on the richer quantile can be increased the federal tax rate by 5% for the uh, third quantile, uh, then 6.5 for the fourth and nine to, for the fifth. In addition to that, we can have a federal tax rate, an introduction of federal tax rates on corporation, a plus 21%. And then also Medicare, one uh, billion more, which goes uh, we assume uniformly to the whole households and population. Now, in terms of uh, uh, expenditure, where well, we can have uh, a transfer uh, of uh, uh, two billions uh, um, to the local government in terms of Medicaid, which then is translated also in a plus one billion spent in services, in additional services. And in, if, if for investment in tourism, we can have more investment from uh, the US and more investment, more tourism from the US, and more investment in finance and insurance, uh, uh, plus 10%. These are hypotheses also um, that are described in the literature based on the assumption that there is some stronger confidence after statehood which can boost uh, the investment in certain specific sectors. Let me see what could be, um, let me show you what could be the outcomes in terms of value added, which mean growth in, uh, in the production and, and also in the wages and profits in particular. There is a general uh, positive impact, especially uh, in finance insurance for the plus 10%. Um, in other sectors, which are through consumption effects mostly, there is a, a, a positive impact on, uh, on employment. Here we have employment by occupation, so summing up uh, different uh, demand of occupation across uh, different sectors. So we can see that uh, there is a composition of different occupation. Um, and also other services which are mostly in the government service. So uh, in terms of disposable income or national income, um, national income is before taxes. And we see that um, there is a reduction in the, in the corporation uh, income and uh, also a slight increase in the income of the uh, all quintiles, a quintiles of the households. What happened after distribution with disposable income, we can see this structural benefit in taxation is, as uh, was mentioned, favoring households, the, the, first, the first quintile, the poor households, which see their income uh, boost and particularly the ex the post taxation for the other house, households is, uh, is almost uh, um, 
is much, is much smaller for the second and uh, is slightly negative for, for, the, for the richest. So a certain distributional impact, we see that uh, before distribution, there is a, a small reduction in the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of the of the inequality, and a larger, much stronger uh, reduction uh, after distribution. In general, okay, we, here we have a savings uh, and the balances. Uh, we see that corporation um, are somehow hit by these are raising in corporate taxes, uh, and uh, but in general the government benefits, and then uh, in general there is a, a partial um, moderate growth in in the, in, in the entire economy. So uh, another statehood, uh, a statehood, um, 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 let's say a scenario is uh, on top of what we just said. We can have a reduction in local taxes and expenditure. Uh, why? Because, of course, uh, there will be too much fiscal pressure, and there can be a partial reduction of uh, expenditure to offset this reduction in the fiscal pressure. But at the same time, um, there can be a minus 20% of investment in, uh, in the manufacturer. And this is because uh, with the statehood uh, hypothesis, uh, um, there will be less uh, tax incentives for 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 uh, manufacturing in general as it is now. So that could be one of the outcomes. So uh, we here mm, the scenario is uh, is just uh, somehow reversed. Uh, is so the fact that uh, there is such contraction in manufacturing is affecting also other sectors via spillover effects via inter-industry relationship in linkages. In demand, and we see that not only manufacturing is cutting by 20%, but also other related sectors are also declining, which uh, have an implication in the, uh, let's say, employment profile. So those profiles that are more intensively employed in the manufacturing the related sector are hit the most. Why, for example, other services which are so in the government sector are not. Um, then, uh, uh, in terms of national income, um, the, the income before taxation, the net income before taxation, then we have uh, corporation income is uh, relatively high. At the same time, so with the general government, but uh, uh, then, uh, let's say, with, uh, with the redistribution, we have a similar effect as before, so that the corporation is is reduced, the income of corporations is used at post tax, and uh, there is uh, definitely an improvement of the of the incomes of the of the first the poorest, but not much of the other groups. So there is still a positive redistributional effect. If we see the Gini coefficient before and after, but there is a significant uh, heat in the economy because of this. Uh, um, reduction in manufacturing. So this is a warning, let's say, a sign of um, uh, for um, a need for an, an additional industrial policy to, to support uh, manufacturing. Well, independence. Independence, there are a number of assumptions. We, uh, we assume that there is no changes in outgoing to contribution to federal uh, government plans, but there is a reduction in incoming transfers in the forms of no scholarships, a housing assistance, tuition assistance, so a number of benefits that go directly to the households. Uh, we don't assume expenditure reduction and the expenditure reduction. In terms of labor market, uh, we consider no changes in, uh, in the wages. Uh, somehow the population, there can be some population adjustments, some labor market adjustments in terms of uh, uh, maybe people uh, um, um, leaving, but also the pressure on wages to go down and those compensating with each other. And in terms of trade and tourism, there is there can be a reduction in the trade costs. Uh, we assume by 10%, a devaluation, assuming 20%, and more tourists for the rest of the world. If we if we consider there be to be easier for tourists from the rest of the world to come with a different uh, uh, visa system. So with this, uh, um, in this scenario, 
we, we see that uh, um, some sectors can be hit, uh, for example, real estate and rental and leasing. Um, um, some other sectors can also be uh, declining and uh, employment by occupation also can, can, can be suffering by these uh, effects. Um, at the same time, other, other sectors can also grow. Uh, the question in terms of distribution, we see that profits of, distribu uh, of, of, of cooperation are, are relatively higher and general government uh, revenues are also higher in this new taxation structure. What we want to show here is also that uh, household income is growing, but because this configuration is more, is more an export-oriented economy and profits are going, um, um, growing faster than the wages, then there is uh, a tendency bias for the, the richest household, like fifth quintile households. Uh, uh, will earn a larger share of profits to gain uh, the most. Uh, after a distribution here, we have a problem that the distribution is not as favorable as before in terms of uh, um, benefits for the poor. We have seen that there is a generalized cut in certain benefits. And so uh, you see that uh, there is a uh, um, a reduction even in the first uh, in, for the poor. Now, in terms of Gini coefficient, now we have uh, uh, before and, and after redistribution, with before an increase in inequality and after uh, a, a, a rather large increase in inequality because of these cuts in, uh, in the benefits. So uh, these are the savings and the balances uh we can see that we are running surpluses because this deficit from the usa role means that we are running surpluses towards the usa and and uh, and the rest of the world but the cost uh, in terms of uh, um income um, could be could be high especially for the for the for the for its households so motor export oriented economy is, has a stronger external position to the US and the rest of the world, but then because effect on uh, on the real GDP, because of course it's, it's showing it might decline, but is uh, almost zero. Um, devaluation is, is an important factor here, but uh, um, in general, when, when the economy becomes more export oriented and uh, it needs to export more, reduce prices, uh, there can be a tendency of reducing also the average wage. And here we have an hypothesis of a cut of 20% of uh, average wage. And you see it's a similar scenario as before, uh, but even worse in terms of a distributional outcome. And, uh, and uh, um, definitely is something that needs to be taken to, in, into consideration also what could be the the wage uh, the effect on, on on the on the wage dynamic the dynamics on the labor market because that will affect uh, both uh, the external the competitiveness but also the 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 internal market and also the uh, inequality the third uh, scenario is on independence and so we also we have a uh, can I have a reduction? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. We have only 12 minutes left. Um, if yes. we can get some conclusions for the presentation or some, you know, beginning yes. conclusions so that we can, ha um, we Absolutely. already have some wonderful questions from the audience that we'd love um, to be able to ask you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, reduction in trace cost, uh, 20 percent, uh, and uh, and the increase in other services is a much more positive scenario. And we see also occupation is increasing and also households for um, income are also increasing. So in spite of having some redistribution or negative redistribution effect, the fact of not having compensating tax and benefits, there is a positive growth. And I finished here. And for the conclusions, uh, yes, I can let also uh, Jose come in. Thank you. All right. So thank you, everybody, for uh, your patience here. Uh, we try to be 
uh, as short as possible, but that's a, there is a lot of information that we can uh, be discussing here. Uh, I have a question here from Michael about the native, native Hawaiians in, in the case of uh, Hawaii. Um, we cite some literature, even though it's not strictly related to the macroeconomic out outcomes. That is what it, we are trying to evaluate. We did um, cite some reference about how native Hawaiians were displaced uh, after statehood in the case of, of Hawaii, and especially because of the level of price increase. Uh, and it's important also to uh, consider that under statehood, we still have the Jones Act. The Jones Act is harming the Hawaii economy. Actually, there are some people there that is opposed to the Jones Act, as well as in many other places in the, in the, the US. Uh, how do we capture capital investment and entrepreneurship in our growth model? Uh, well, what we did is what Matthew presented there, that if you increase investment in particular sector, that's what some people that support statehood say, that uh, under statehood, more uh, investors from the United States uh, will perceive more opportunities because they say, well, this the, the institutional uh, uh, the institution in Puerto Rico are stronger and they're going to invest more, especially in finance and insurance. And that's actually what happened in Hawaii as well. Uh, and, and increase also in, in investment in real estates. So what we did is just to assume that uh, under statehood that will increase 10%. Uh, and in the case of independence, that uh, the gains of in, under independence really come from redu reducing trade costs, not just the Jones Act, in Puerto Rico, le llaman la ley de cabotaje, um, but also because of uh, phytosanitary uh, regulations that are being imposed from the United States to Puerto Rico, uh, and so on and so forth. So I, I want also to clarify that everything that Masi uh, stayed there in the, in the presentation, that's our assumptions. So outcomes are what you see in the graph and when, what it is in the, in the, what is in the test are assumptions. So what will happen if these things happen, what will be the outcome? So that we can evaluate different uh, scenario because this is there, there is a lot of uncertainty uh, uh, here. Uh, I see that here uh, there is another question about the culture. I am really not uh, an expert in culture. Jari uh, Mar is actually the expert here in, uh, in cultural anthropologies, but yes. Uh, I, I, as I said, it is important to study if we are interested in that area, the case of New Mexico, um, because in, in New Mexico, they have a large population that was Hispanic at the moment of statehood, and they have a lot of uh, discussion there uh, on how the, that Hispanic population was considered a second class citizen and so on and so forth. Uh, this are correct. Uh, yeah, so at the end of the day, uh, I believe that under statehood and under independence, what matters is how the uh, business sector reacts. Uh, is the business sector either under statehood or, or under independence being become larger and, and engage more in, in exporting and taking benefit from, from the institutional arrangement? Uh, they can benefit, but just because they are coming federal funding, or, or or just because you sign, uh, uh, in the case of state and in the case of independent, just because you sign uh, a, a trade deal by itself is not going to to bring prosperity to to Puerto Rico. So, it, and that's actually the conclusion that Gal has. Maybe I can share my, my the the conclusions that we have from our presentation here. Um, yes, so these are, are sort of say our conclusions. Uh, the, 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 the colonial model wore out, and there are threat or opportunities under both statehood and independence. Uh, but as the GAO stated in 2014, the precise nature of such changes are, are uncertain. Uh, it, it will depend on, on how uh, Puerto Rico. And the, and the rest, especially the business side, uh, react to, to the changes. 
So uh, which countries do you think will trade with us if we were to gain independence of Puerto Rico? I believe Puerto Rico is going to be more integrated to the uh, Latin American region. Right now, Puerto Rico is, is kind of a satellite economy from the United States, especially because of the Young Act. It's been restricted or, or it's been isolated from the, from the Caribbean and from Latin America. So under independence, Puerto Rico will trade more uh, with the Antilles and with, the, uh, with South America, uh, because that's what the gravity theory predicts, that you trade more with nearby countries than with countries that are far behind. Uh, it doesn't mean Puerto Rico will not trade with the United States. The United States is the largest market in the world. Uh, it can keep trading with the United States, but it's going to trade also more with uh, nearby countries. Uh, can you summarize the findings of what startup option best benefit Puerto Rico in economic terms? Well, what we, if you uh, look at and very closely, what we have here is that we have optimistic scenarios and pessimistic scenarios under both uh, statehood and independence. So under statehood, the best scenario is if no manufacturing uh, company from the United States leave uh, when they have to pay federal taxes. Uh, if none of them leave, or maybe some of them leave and others come, uh, then in the manufacturing sector remains stable, uh, the change to stable will not be that bad. But if, if many manufacturing firms in Puerto Rico uh, move because they don't want to pay federal taxes for the income generated in Puerto Rico, the economy of Puerto Rico is, soft, is going to suffer a lot. In the case of independence, if business in Puerto Rico take advantage of the new opportunities and start exporting more and substituting more imports and, and taking advantage of that, those re reduction in trade costs and start to promote the island in other places beside, beyond, beyond the United States, especially for tourism, uh, the economy is going to do uh, better. But if the under independence, if the if the uh, entrepreneurs in the island remain a little bit shy as, as they are right now, or many of them are right now, and they don't export, uh, and the, uh, they don't take advantages of the new opportunities that come with independence, and uh, the economy is not is not is not going to to be uh, as good as we would like. I don't know if Matthew, you want to add something to all those questions. No, no, as, as you said, I mean, uh, there are infinite ways to conceive uh, scenarios and the more you see forward, I mean, in the medium to the long run, uh, the more everything becomes possible. So we need just to uh, maybe have a perspective of what could be the, the short to medium run in terms of impact uh, with uh, assumption, let's say what we know that uh, can happen with a certain, because we know that these policies are possible. And of course, uh, um, those, these uh, analysis is uh, providing us some warning signals of, uh, of possible uh, negative outcomes or positive outcomes just to think, uh, think through. Um, what should be the policies in either case. Thank you. We have um, one more question in the Q&A box um, that I think would be great to sort of close this really fascinating conversation out. And it's, what did you learn that surprised you or that you did not suspect to find over the course of the study? Because I think, you know, we've had these conversations a lot, but like what would happen with the status change? Was there anything in this analysis um, that surprised you or that was unexpected? Well, in my case, the uh, uh, imposition of federal income taxes in the island will have devastating effects, uh, uh, not just to the business, what I said in the case of manufacturing, but also to the population. The, the tax rate in Puerto Rico, or the tax burden will increase a lot and the local government will have to do something. So uh, the the just a reduction of 20% in the manufacturing sector is, is going to cause a lot of pain in, 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 in the macroeconomic outcomes of the island. That sur surprised me a lot. I didn't thought that 
uh, is going to, to create such a, a large um, uh, impact. And in the case of, of independence, I uh, also were expecting that uh, a devaluation of 10% will be enough, um, but it's not actually. We will, we will need a, a, a larger devaluation than that to help the economy counteract the loss of federal funding. Um, so that was uh, new to me. And actually, I think that's the first time that uh, a study like this has been done, that where you evaluate uh, many factors at the same time. So you have the factor of the federal funding that you either gain or lose federal funding, but also you have uh, movement in the real sector. So what will be the net impact of, of this movement? I think that's uh, one of the things that, that, that I uh, learned the most from. From this story, and um, Massey, I don't know if you want to add something to it. Yes, yes, definitely. And we need to consider also um, sometimes there are effects which are uh, counteracting each other. For example, the evaluation and some aspects are increasing maybe competitiveness at the same time. They can be increasing costs of uh, not only for consumer but also for production so some of those uh, they might partly offset each other in addition to that if you also uh, want to um, do an internal devaluation reduce wages you have to consider what are the consequences in terms of uh, uh distribution and and the redistribution and wealth i mean these are um, models uh, let's say the, the export more export oriented model uh, need to be thought through uh, considering all these aspects and impacts also the distribution one uh j just to to uh help the audience a, de a devaluation means that the currency the, your own currency uh it's it worth less against the the US dollar, which is the international currency right now. So it is important that the audience realize that for an independent Puerto Rico, uh, it is in the best interest of the economy of an independent Puerto Rico to have its own currency. More than the patriotic uh, sentiments or emotions, it is good for the economy because you can devaluate the currency and, and promote export. And that's what I, what, what Iceland did in 2007, and that's what the Dominican Republic did in 2004, when they have uh, the Van Inter uh, crisis. Uh, so so that, that's why we, we uh, consider uh, devaluation as an important tool, because that's one of the things that most of the central banks around the world are using to promote growth. Great. So we're out of time. Um, this really was just a wonderful um, conversation. I'm so happy that we had a chance to listen to this really important research. Um, and for everybody in the audience, we will continue to keep doing these cafecitos in conjunction with the Bridging the Divides Decolonization Study Group. So please keep an eye out for um, those and also all other um, center events. We've just launched our 50th anniversary celebration. So we have a lot of really wonderful um, events coming up for that as well. So just um, keep an eye on our social media channels, our website, and we hope to see you soon in another event. Thank you again to Jose and Masi, and I hope everybody else has a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.